Welcome to Asian American Life. I'm your host, Ernabel DeMillo. In this episode, we take a look at what's making headlines in politics, arts, and entertainment. And the talk of the town right here at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum is Tales of Our Time, a groundbreaking exhibit. I'm going to give you a behind the scenes tour, but first, here's what's ahead on our show. Inside Politics, Paul Lin reports on the Trump of the East, Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte. Raising Faith, Kyung Yoon looks at the changing face of Christianity. Minnie Ro shares how a modern day Korean Jane Eyre is taking Hollywood by storm. And I discover a whole new world with the cast of Aladdin. This and more on Asian American Life. Tales of Our Time features the works of eight young contemporary Chinese artists who use storytelling to explore time and space. We got a guided tour from the curator herself. The underlying theme of Tales of Our Time is to challenge a conventional and traditional understanding of how we define a place. This place can be as specific as a city, as a location, or as broad as the concept of China. And that work is called a Mythological Time by a Beijing-based artist Sun Xun. He took his hometown Fuxing as a starting point for his research. And the city used to host one of the biggest open coal mines in Asia. And then with the decline of the coal production, the city also went into sort of a very defunct situation. So Sun Xun really used that metaphor to look at the moving of powers based on the natural source of, you know, uh, energy. The robot piece is called Can't Help Myself and it's a metaphor in understanding the border and territory controls and also the conflicts that we are having right now. I do feel is to open up their perspective and challenge their understanding of art from China and really make them feel like, oh wow, this is something that I can only see here at the Guggenheim and also really give me new ideas of what these artists are thinking and what kind of works that I might expect from them. You can learn more about the Guggenheim's Tale of Our Times and all our stories by following us on Facebook at Asian American Life. Now up next, we take a look at the impact of Philippine politics right here at home. I'm Paul Lin. When Donald Trump won the U.S. presidential election, one of the world leaders who quickly congratulated him was Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte. His brash talk has earned him the nickname Trump of the East and both men have ridden a populist wave into power. Similar to Trump, people feel he says what he thinks, unlike traditional politicians who always hide behind empty, what people feel is empty rhetoric. You know, they never get the sense that the, the, the politicians are straight talkers, whereas Duterte came across as a fresh voice and one that's not afraid to ruffle some feathers when irritated, whether it's the UN Secretary General over human rights issues, or the President of the United States, or even the Pope for causing a traffic jam in Manila. Should the world take all this at face value? His cabinet officials and some of his off, um, advisors are telling us, journalists, that don't take him too seriously when he curses, when he says these words. Sometimes he doesn't really mean them. Sometimes he says them because it's just an expression to him. Because he's the kind of person who is prone to cursing and saying expletives. Duterte's tough guy reputation comes from his early years as the anti-crime mayor of Davao City. Luis Francia recalls his first time meeting Duterte for an interview. He comes roaring in on a motorcycle, 45 caliber, tucked into his belt. He was young, so was I, and roguish. If you didn't know him or his record, it was very appealing. He was overflowing with confidence. He said, yeah, I can take care of this town. As Mayor Duterte, nicknamed the Punisher, did for decades. I've served government for almost 30 years waging an iron-fisted war on criminals in which he said the best solution is to kill them all. 
organizations from the UN to Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch suggest that death squads working with police helped execute at least 1,400 people during his time as mayor, with many thousands more killed since he became president. You had death squads operating, but he's always denied that he had a direct hand in these, but you know, you set the tone, you encourage, and he never went after the vigilantes. He did bring the crime rate down. So, you know, but the question is at what, at what cost? It's the same question being asked in the Philippines. How can the method be separated from the results? And what happens to civil liberties and due process in a street justice environment? The dead cannot defend themselves. So if I were to shoot you, and I'll put the, which they do, put the car cardboard sign, drug pusher, who's to say otherwise, right? And most of them have been poor. They've been the marginalized. My relatives, my friends are telling me, you know, it's so safe to walk the streets now. It's, um, we, we really like what he's doing. So when I ask them, what about the killings? Are you okay with that? and they are not comfortable with the killings. They still feel that the law, the, it, all this cleaning, uh, all this, that this campaign should operate within the law, that there should be a hearing, there should be a court. People are entitled to lawyers. Acting with impunity is something you'd expect from a dictatorship like that of former President Ferdinand Marcos, who declared martial law and built the Philippine economy of billions of dollars, coinciding with the torture and murder of thousands. Today, some say President Duterte is getting things done, fast-tracking the resolution of problems like drugs and crime. But in such an environment, local officials suspected of crimes still can get gunned down, even when they're turning themselves in. Politicians critical of policies may find themselves on the receiving end of smear tactics. Freedom of speech and the press may suffer. Certainly. People are afraid. They don't want necessarily to come out and say things that might be interpreted by somebody in the neighborhood who might want to score points or has a grudge and then provides misinformation to the local cops. And you never know. So there's a, a lot of fear. And what about the Trump administration sometime in the near future fast-tracking a Chinese Exclusion Act for Muslims? Or even going back to Japanese-American-style internment camps? Both uh, historical uh, incidents can be used as parallels. Um, you know, there is absolutely the fear that you will be labeled a terrorist simply because of your faith. Just as being a Japanese or Japanese-American during World War II was enough to, for people to think your civil liberties should be suspended. All this from a guy seen as a political outsider, someone supporters believe may get things done in Washington, fixing everything wrong for those frustrated with status quo administrations for failing to improve their lives. In short, a populist leader. And across the world, it's become a wave. We saw it in the UK with the Brexit referendum, but it's elsewhere in Europe. And it's definitely in the US and the Philippines. Some people are saying maybe the millennials are driving this wave. I do not know. And I don't know. Maybe also it's a sense of despair that uh, we have been in this situation for a long time, at least in the Philippines, and nothing ever gets done. One thing scheduled to get done in 2017, a White House visit by the Philippine president, invited by Donald Trump in a recent telephone conversation. And President Duterte has reciprocated with an invite to the Philippines. I'm Paul Lin for Asian American Life. Asian Americans are the fastest growing ethnic group in the U.S. And according to the Pew Research Center, nearly half identify as Christians. The roots of Christianity in Asian American communities date back to over a century ago. It starts with the immigrant experience. I think for first generation, they went to church, yes, because of faith. Part of it was for survival. It was where they could go and rest. 
Eugene Cho, a Korean American pastor in Seattle, Washington, leads a multi ethnic and multicultural church called Quest. He was six years old when his family immigrated to the U.S. and has vivid memories of his parents struggling to survive in an unfamiliar country. My parents worked at a grocery store 8 a.m. to 11 p.m., forcing themselves to speak a language that they could not speak. So when they went to church on Sundays, I saw them effervescent. He also saw how the church, founded by Korean immigrants, was more than a spiritual home, but also a place that provided vital social services. So when you're an immigrant, when you're a refugee, when you are a marginalized outsider in a country where you're a minority, I think it makes our dependence on faith, on Christ, that much more important. We don't take it for granted. When people immigrate, they often have a hard time finding a place to call home. And churches have provided that, that churches form culturally. They, they, they often preserve the culture in America. President Dale Irvin of the New York Theological Seminary says that Asian American churches today, like all immigrant churches, are being challenged to balance the needs of new generations of churchgoers who are culturally assimilated and embracing new ideas about identity, community, and fellowship. So I'm watching that happen inside the church. There's a, an older generation of leadership and they have a certain kind of understanding of what the church is like. And there's another generation coming up underneath them that have a very different understanding of what leadership is, a very different understanding of the kinds of, of, of patterns that the church should be fulfilling. There's another significant trend of multiculturalism on the rise. I still see among Asian Americans a real sensitivity to the global multicultural identity and, and not an exclusion, not trying to outpace other groups, but really trying to build a new kind of community. The kind of community that Pastor Eugene Cho says he felt called to create in his church. As someone living in the United States, what I saw was an incredibly fast changing culture. And while we needed Korean American and other homogenous churches, I believe God brought me to the United States Yes, to embrace my calling as a Korean American person, but I also felt that part of my calling here was to be a light and salt to the larger culture as well. If church becomes reduced in the modern era where you just come and go. Pastor Cho is one of the growing numbers of visible Asian Americans in the Christian leadership. He's met with President Obama and been invited by Martin Luther King Jr.'s daughter, Dr. Bernice King, to speak at the Ebenezer Baptist Church on Martin Luther King Day. In recent years, more and more Asian Americans are seen in prominent roles of leadership. InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, one of the largest evangelical organizations on college campuses, elected Tom Lin as the first non-white president in its 75-year history. Lausanne Movement, an evangelical organization founded by world-renowned evangelist Billy Graham, has as its CEO a Korean-American, Michael O. Oh. And in 2016, the oldest Baptist missionary organization in North America unanimously elected Sharon Coe to be its executive director. Coe is the first woman to lead the organization in its more than 200-year history. My favorite part about my face is that written on it is the truth that God's mission is now from everywhere to everyone because this gospel went all the way and came all the way back and will continue to go. We have been at work on the ground, faithful, serving in churches, serving in organizations for a long, long time. So I'm really grateful and encouraged by that. I'm excited that other people are beginning to recognize this as well. One of my mentors, his name is Dr. John Perkins, is an African-American activist who was part of the civil rights movement, spent time with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He said, everyone needs to be loved. Everyone needs to be heard. 
and everyone needs to be part of something greater than themselves. So as a church, we want to be able to speak of those things. And certainly because we have many Asian Americans come to be culturally sensitive to them as well. According to the Pew Research Center, immigrants are playing a key role in revitalizing churches across America. And it's clear that Asian Americans are helping to change the face of Christianity as leaders and as lay people. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. I'm Minnie Rowe. It is a true Cinderella story. Korean-American author Patricia Park spent 10 years working on her first novel, which finally got published in May 2015. And then Hollywood came knocking on her door, and now this book is being adapted into a television series. The New York Times calls it a truly fresh, modern take on the coming-of-age novel. Entertainment Weekly says it's snappy and memorable. Still others have heralded her writing style as astute, resonating, humorous. I boarded the 7 train leaving the Main Street Flushing Station. Rejane Jane is a modern-day spin on Charlotte Bronte's classic Jane Eyre. It's set in Flushing, Queens, and Jane is a half-Korean, half-American orphan. The novel begins with Jane finding out that her Wall Street job offer has disappeared along with the dot-com bubble burst. She is working at her family grocery store under the watchful eye of her disapproving uncle, where people judge her because of her hunya or mixed race heritage. Jane is like a minority within a minority. Um, the girl kind of can't catch a break, and she has the eyes of flushing, kind of looking and parsing her genetics. Like her protagonist, author Patricia Park grew up in Flushing. Her parents own a grocery store, and she admits she sometimes felt out of place dealing with the strict and unspoken expectations of life in a Korean home. How much of Jane is actually you? Like Jane, I think I had a lot of these kind of cultural eye-opening experiences where um, being in my case, born and raised in America and being educated by an American system, you have one way of thinking, but then at home, it's a completely different way. As a young girl, Park says she was a loner, always feeling like an outsider. She sought refuge in the comforting world of books. Maybe it was because I was one of those um, chubby, four-eyed, brace-faced kids <laughs> that spent recess just reading books and not, um, I didn't have a lot of friends. Commuting from Queens to the Bronx during high school, she would pass by Manhattan and find herself yearning to one day head for the big city. It was only through her writing that she began to embrace who she was, where she came from, and only then was she able to appreciate the beauty of her home borough. There are so many rich stories here, despite the grit, despite the blue collarness of the borough, and I want to show that. And I I want to show how something that seems so plain and so just functionary can be beautiful. The beauty in the story of Jane's journey from outer borough to inner peace caught the eye of a well-known Korean star in Hollywood, Daniel Day Kim. Rejane Jane is, is currently in development for a TV series um, with Paramount and TV Land. And Daniel Day Kim, who we all famously know for Lost and Hawaii Five-O um, has his own production company, and his um, and that company took interest in, in my in my novel, and they wanted to get more Asian American stories and specifically Korean American stories out there. Park says she never dreamed that she would hit a home run with her first novel right off the bat. What was it like when you first heard that he was going to executive produce your book? I said, "Shut up!" I'm like, "No, <laughs> get out!" I may have like dropped the phone and ran away. Um, I think actually I was trembling. I'm like, and you know when something good happens, you don't let yourself believe it. And I, I still don't let myself believe it because there are still many obstacles. Um, from my understanding, Hollywood is like the the field of broken dreams. Or um, so uh, I. But ultimately, I was so floored and flattered and um, that, that uh, Jane's story resonated with another um, Korean American. Margaret Cho's All-American Girl in the mid-90s featured a Korean American lead character. The show was canceled after one season amid criticism for watering down the material to appeal to a wider audience. As a consulting producer, Park vows that Rejane will stay true to her Korean-American storyline. 
the writer and I are continually in contact, um, you know, almost on a daily basis. She'll she'll ask questions about to get those specific details right. Like, what are the names of you know those middle-aged women with the curly perms? I'm like, oh, the Ajma, and then I'll have to then I'll go on a whole cultural rant or lecture about the the role of the the Ajma in Korean society and. And, um, and, and then that leads to other questions. The past decade has been full of struggles for Park, but she never gave up on her dream to publish Re Jane. She took on several jobs, teaching creative writing at SUNY Purchase, publishing articles as a journalist, filling in as needed at her parents' grocery store. There were certain moments in that basically decade-long process where you hit some lows and you just you don't think you're going to climb out of whatever hole or well that you're in, um, and, and you think that the work will never see the light of day. But she says all of it was worth it when she was finally able to show her parents that her years of labor had paid off. Were your parents thrilled? Um, they are, yeah. And um, I took them to see The King and I, and they met Daniel backstage, and it was just such a wonderful moment. I, I think I was happier to see them meet than even all that was going on. And it, it, it's corny to say, but it made me feel like all of their struggles from North Korea to South Korea to Argentina to, to New York and all of the immigrant struggles that they had and sacrifices, hopefully it's come to something that they can be proud of. No word yet on when Re Jane will hit the airwaves. Meanwhile, Patricia Park is hard at work on her second novel. I'm Minnie Rowe for Asian American Life. Disney's Aladdin is one of the most popular musicals on Broadway, and it has one of the most diverse casts, including several Asian Americans in the lead role. I got to go behind the scenes with some of your favorites. <laughs> so I'm Disneyfied, right there, that's me. I try to make that face every night. <laughs> if you watch Aladdin on Broadway, you may recognize that laugh. No? How about now? <laughs> <laughs> Don Daryl Rivera has been entertaining audiences with that laugh and his comedic skills since Aladdin premiered on Broadway in 2014. For Rivera, a super Disney fan, the role of Iago, Jafar's sidekick, was a dream come true. When Disney called, it was it, it was so magical. I mean, like, I'm getting emotional just talking about it right now. It they they literally have changed my life. I, I'm so thankful to them because. Uh, this is my dream job. I get to be a Disney villain uh, on Broadway eight times a week. Like, it's so cool. It really is so cool. Rivera, who is Filipino-American, is part of one of the more diverse casts on Broadway. Three Asian Americans are in the featured roles, including Adam Jacobs in the title role and Courtney Reed as one of Disney's most famous princess, Jasmine. There are also several Asian Americans in the ensemble. I grew up watching all of the Disney princess movies, of course, like as like a little girl, all the classics, like I grew up with the classics. So when I watched Aladdin, like it just had a different impact on me, not even I didn't even really know then, but now looking back, I thought, oh my gosh, no wonder I identified so much with her. I interviewed Reed and Jacobs recently at the historic New Amsterdam Theater, their home for a couple years now. And we've spent a lot of time together to get to know each other, and so we're really close off stage, and, and we, we're lucky we're able to recreate that, that love every night. Ow. <laughs> yeah, you know, they, they, there's a saying, that if you have offstage chemistry, then you have onstage chemistry. Their offstage chemistry is apparent during the interview. They finish each other's sentences. We've been through so many things together right. that it's hard to not she's, become close. She's trying to say we're basically an old married couple. We're basically that's, all. That's what we're saying. But, we know all the but tricks. But when we're up there, the audience, they, they, see, they see love at first sight. Yeah, there's a, there's has to be a sense of comfort when you're on stage doing things that are maybe like Intimate. Kind of like an intimate, yeah. like kind of awkward thing, really. We have to fall in love with the same person every single night. Jacobs, whose mother is Filipino, is a Broadway veteran. He starred in Les Miserables as Marius and was Simba in The Lion King. Meanwhile, Jacobs Jasmine Reed, whose mom is Vietnamese, is also a familiar face on the Broadway stage. She made her debut on Mamma Mia and starred in In the Heights. For the cast, it has been one magical carpet ride. And speaking of carpets, I was wondering. I have to ask, though, about that magic carpet. How does it fly? I think it's Tinkerbell. 
Yeah. Take the Tinkerbell dolls. Uh, Santa's, Santa's sleigh technology. Oh, yeah. Well, I we see. have different theories, apparently. <laughs> they, along with Rivera, are part of the small but growing number of Asian Americans on Broadway. According to the latest Asian American Performers Action Coalition study, the 24-2015 season was the most diverse in nine years since they have been collecting data. Ali Ewalt is the first Asian American to play the lead Christine in Phantom of the Opera. And Ann Sanders is the first Asian American to play Anna in The King and I. For actors who are half Asian, often referred to as ethnically ambiguous, different doors have opened. When I was auditioning for roles, um, specifically Asian roles, I would get comments. Um, I'd hear from my agent that the casting directors didn't think I was Asian enough. At the same time, I've been able to play such a wide range of different characters that I'm totally cool with that. I can tell you that I have literally auditioned for my actual ethnicity once in my entire life. Their castmate Rivera also recalls some of the challenges. I did definitely face some struggles, but I, I, I felt like I was the wild card. I felt like they called me in because they wanted to take a chance on me. I, I, I never thought I would be given the opportunity to, to lead a company or to uh, be a principal. Um, I, but again, I have to be so thankful for people being so open-minded in the theater community to, to break stereotype and to break traditional casting and, and take a chance on people who look like me. <laughs> and maybe, just maybe, we'll see more of that kind of casting happening. I'm Ernabel DeMillo for Asian American Life. If you want to learn more about our stories, you can follow us on Facebook at Asian American Life. And be sure to stop by Tales of Our Time right here at the Guggenheim Museum. I'm Ernabel DeMillo for Asian American Life. We'll see you next time.